you. We're going to get started here. Um, I'm Dean Kraft, and uh, talking today about the, uh, the Vivo project, enabling national networking of uh, scientists. And uh, my co-presenter is Val Davis. Um, so the Vivo project is, among other things, a very large collaboration, as you can see. There are uh, seven schools involved and a number of uh, developers and implementers at each one. Um, in the talk, I will give a sort of a high-level overview of what Vivo is. Um, and then I'll look under the covers and talk uh, in more detail about uh, how it works. Then um, Val will take over and talk about how we're actually implementing it um, at the sort of social and organizational level. Um, and then a little about what's ahead for Vivo. So as research efforts become um, more interdisciplinary, um, it can be hard to find collaborators, um, certainly outside of your own narrow area. This is a, a problem for um, a lot of disciplines, uh, and biomedical area in particular. So there's a challenge to locate people to build um, large teams. Uh, Vivo is designed to help um, People find the collaborations that are really important in uh, modern science. And it allows you to find things both within the institution and outside, across institutional boundaries. And both scientists and um, administrators, uh, students, faculty, others beyond can get a sense of and explore the uh, disciplines, researchers, faculty at an institution. So what is Vivo? Um, it's a semantic web application, use, uh, a web application using uh, semantic web technologies that enables uh, discovery of research and scholarship across an institution. Um, it's made up of detailed profiles of faculty and researchers um, and gives a lot of dimensions of faculty uh, expertise and involvement. I'll talk about a number of those throughout. Um, and it gives you a powerful search functionality that lets you really sort of explore and um, search and parse out the information uh, to find what you need. So a Vivo profile is um, detailed information about an individual drawn from what Vivo collects. Um, it, it allows you to sort of illustrate your own expertise, make people aware of that. Um, as compared to a standard sort of web page description or a uh, social networking site, it tends to have richer content um, drawn from a number of sources about the individual. And it's more explicit. And I'll talk about some technical ways in which it's, uh, it's more explicit. So who can use Vivo? Um, it's the goal of the NIH project, the National Institutes of Health Vivo project, is really to enable national networking and collaboration for biomedical researchers. And so a, a fundamental user group is really the faculty and researchers looking to find other people to work with. But at Cornell, um, it's been heavily used by um, prospective faculty and students, particularly when exploring a complex discipline like the life sciences. We have um, faculty and expertise scattered all across a number of colleges, departments, uh, programs at the institution. And for somebody outside trying to find who to work with can be a real challenge. Um, it's also useful for administrators in making connections. Um, the Cornell uh, Development Office um, was contacted by a major company looking for researchers in a particular area. And using Vivo, they were quickly able to pull up a number of people from different departments and, uh, and actually make the, make the translation to real funding dollars for the, uh, for the institution. So Vivo also can serve as a real disseminator of, uh, of information. It, uh, it draws stuff from a variety of sources and then lets you reskin, repurpose 
um, you know, various cuts across that information to give specialized views of the institution. So I mentioned the life sciences. There's, this is a view that gives you a sort of portal onto the, uh, the graduate programs in the life sciences and lets you explore that, again, across departments, across the sort of traditional web boundaries. Um, here's another example, which is a research portal showing, highlighting research activities in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences at, uh, at Cornell. Another example, people looking for particular expertise in an area like uh, climate change or um, you know, any, any area within the institution, in fact. You can build a specific portal that will draw out that kind of information. And finally, here's a collaborate at Cornell site um, that has expertise shown in geographic areas across the world. So if you're looking for somebody to collaborate with in a particular country, again, you can get hold of that information and um, find out who might be available as a good partner. So how does it work? Let's look under the covers a little. So, Vivo is built by harvesting data from um, authoritative university sources, um, verified sources within the institution. This allows you to build up for an individual faculty member a fairly complete profile without their having to do anything, which since faculty are very busy people, um, is a real advantage. Um, it centralizes the information in a common format. I, I just showed you a bunch of sort of skins across Vivo and uh, and it gives you then a pool of um, information that you can draw on for those purposes. So we, Vivo takes information from internal data sources, uh, sources of record at the institution, external data sources as well, um, publisher information, others from outside. And finally, it lets people um, edit and customize their profiles. Um, and we'll talk a lot more about that. Um, So storing data in Vivo. I mentioned that Vivo is built on semantic web technologies. Information is stored using a format called the Resource Description Framework, RDF. Um, and the data is structured as triples, where you have a subject, a predicate, or a relationship, and then an object. Um, and these triples are, so the relationships and the nature of the subject and object are, uh, are specified in a shared ontology, which is essentially just a description of the meaning of those, uh, those pieces and how they relate to each other. Um, let's look at a more detailed example from uh, Cornell. So here we have a um, particular researcher, um, faculty member at the institution, who is the author of a particular paper, who teaches a course at the institution, um, who is featured in a particular news article, um, a member of a department, is heading up a particular research program, works in a particular research area, is a co-author with another uh, faculty member who's also in the same research area. So you have people identified by these explicit relationships with um, unique and defined objects in the system. So there's only one crop management. If somebody puts crops management in for their uh, department or department of crop management or something else, you don't have that kind of a matching problem. These objects are, are firmly defined in the, uh, in the system. So once you have all this information available, you can then query and explore it. You can explore it by sort of those individual objects. So everything about, you can look at everything about an, an event, a grant, a person, and the system will allow you to display information that way. You can look at things by type, so a class of events or whatever, um, by a specific relationship. So you can look for grants with PIs that come from different colleges within the institution and just pull out those kinds of grants and by various other combinations and, and facets, exploring by publication and co-authorship, by grant, co-PI, um, and you know, geographic, many different sort of cuts and, um, 
and expirations across the, uh, the information. So here's an example from uh, the site. You've got um, a single grant and linked information about the, the principal investigator, about the administrator of the grant, um, the, uh, the co-PIs, and these are all live links. You can click on them to explore further the sort of network of, of relationships among all the pieces. There's another example where you browsing by a type, a class of things, in this case by seminar series. So these are all the seminar series at the, uh, uh, at the institution and you can pick individual ones or explore that way as well. You can look at results for a single topic, in this case homeostasis, um, <laughs> and you get results that are a mix of you know, faculty, courses, other things connected with homeostasis, and then in turn you can restrict based on facets, so you can restrict it to just the, the people involved or the events involved or whatever. So what are the advantages of using this ontology approach? Um, it provides a key to the, the meaning of these, these objects, um, defined sets of classes and properties in a unique namespace. We're getting a little geeky here. Um, it's embedded as RDF, so the data, if you um, expose all of this data, it's really a self-describing um, set of information. Um, it helps, the, using the ontology lets you align RDF from multiple sources. Um, so multiple institutions, um, from, you can draw information from outside. It also actually internally allows us to align the information as we just draw from different databases within the institution by mapping them to this common ontology. And it lets you um, map to giving, once you have the standard ontology for our own information, it easily lets us map that to other ontologies in the outside world that, that are being used more broadly. Um, and finally, it lets you have, you can have local extensions to the shared ontology that then sort of roll up. So you may have a, a particular refinement of an academic position at your institution that you can just roll up into academic appointment in the common ontology. So with shared ontologies, the individual facts line up in ways that are easy to follow and um, easy to process. Um, without shared ontologies, you tend to wind up with a, a logjam. Your individual facts are piled up on top of each other and uh, can be very hard to sort out the, the underlying relationships and information. So to get even more geeky for a minute, um, we're adhering to the linked data principles. Uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee articulated this as a set of um, principles for um, semantic web information. We use URIs, you know, like a URL, really, uh, uniform resource identifier as the names for things. Um, they're HTTP resolvable, which means you can stick them in a web browser and get some description of what the thing is. Um, we use standards RDF and Sparkle to, uh, um, to exchange information, and we include links to other URIs so that people can discover more things. Uh, so Vivo, as a system at an institution, enables authoritative data about faculty, about researchers, to become part of this overall cloud of linked data applications. Um, and it's growing pretty regularly. You'll see uh, there are a lot of sort of science and biomedical things down here at the bottom. Uh, let's see, music and other things are up here. It's a large um, collection of, of interacting information. So there are some challenges with, uh, with taking the semantic web RDF approach. Um, I'll go through some of them here. One is granularity levels. I mentioned academic appointments before. Those can be very different at different institutions, and as you write an ontology, you know, what level of refinement do you want to, to put? I mean, are, if librarians are faculty at one institution and not at another, you know, how do you, how do you make, make everything line up? How do you come up with a common way of describing the information at a granularity? So that flows over into terminologies. You have to get everybody to agree on a common terminology for um, a lecturer or a department or a program or something else as you build up this 
uh, this common way of talking about things. Scalability, we know that Vivo works well at a single institution. It's been running at Cornell for a while. Um, as we scale up to the national level, we, we expect to face some, uh, some challenges. Fortunately, the underlying semantic web technology has a lot of oomph behind it, and people are building um, more and more scalable solutions all the time. Um, so we're hoping to leverage that, uh, that outside work. Um, disambiguation is an issue. You have you know, publications and other things. You may have different author IDs, different spellings of an author name as you're trying to pull in common information. How do you uh, disambiguate? Provenance is one interesting one. The semantic web, as you saw, it was just a triple uh, sort of subject, relationship, and object. There's nothing that says where that information came from. As you pull these facts from various databases and combine them in the RDF store, you can potentially lose the provenance. You don't know who made the statement and therefore perhaps how authoritative it is. And finally, temporality. The semantic web by its nature really gives you a current snapshot. It shows you exactly the way things are now. Um, and as things change over time, there are ways that you can um, represent you know, the fact that somebody's employment or position or whatever changed over time and keep all of that information, but it tends to make the ontology more complex and harder to work with. So that's, that's a bit of a challenge. But, and this is the handler hypothesis, a little semantics goes a long way. Um, if you can make these simple statements available, you really do get this networked effect where you can combine information and really get, gain a lot more from uh, even simple statements about, uh, about individuals and, and their relationships. So the major components of Vivo, um, it's a general purpose open source web application um, that leverages semantic standards. It includes an ontology editor, a data manager to manage the information about people within the system, and a display manager that lets you put it out there. So that underlying technology actually is not specific to the Vivo project I'm talking about here. It can be used elsewhere for other things. Uh, the Chinese Academy of Sciences is making use of the underlying Vivo technology for um, several websites to connect scientists across China. Um, Australia, univers Australian universities are looking at it as well um, for similar approaches to, uh, to being able to, to network their scientists and publications and other things. Um, so the customizations for this application, for the Vivo project I'm talking about, include a specific Vivo ontology uh, that's focused on um, faculty research and the organizations and structures around that. A specific display theming to, to display that, and then, um, as Val will talk about in a bit, specific sort of implementation and installation um, work that's going together with it. Um, we're also, as part of the project, building additional new software that enables a distributed network uh, of RDF by harvesting from these individual institutions and building across them. And I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. So three functional layers of Vivo. Um, there's a top, the end user piece is a search and browse interface with potential self-editing for individuals. The middle layer is the, the curators of the system. They can sort of set up the display themes, um, the navigation setup. They do curatorial editing. So if you, um, you know, the librarian can put in information about publications about a particular individual to, to kickstart the system. And at the bottom level, there's ontology editing. The system lets you, within itself, without using an external ontology editor, um, manage the ontology and all these relationships and ways of describing information. And then at the bottom, there's data ingest, drawing from the, the uh, authoritative sources at the institution, and data export. So what does the local data flow look like at a particular institution? So you're drawing from local systems of record. Um, at Cornell, we have a PeopleSoft HR system. We pull a lot of information out of that. There's a grants database. There's courses databases, other sources for this. We're also pulling from external um, national sources, things like PubMed, where we get publications. We're in discussions with, uh, with individual publishers about granting us permanent free access to the 
um, basic bibliographic information for our institutions, whether they, they would be willing to make that available to us so that we can incorporate and redistribute it in vivo. Um, so the flow then is into these data ingest ontologies in RDF, which in turn then goes into the vivo ontology, is mapped into the vivo ontology in RDF, where it can be interactively updated by, by curators or by uh, individuals. And finally, it's re-exposed um, as RDF and shared outside using RDFA, which is a format that embeds RDF in web pages. So those display pages I was showing you before would have RDF tags embedded in them um, by harvesting RDF from the institution or potentially by doing these Sparkle queries to a, a Sparkle endpoint that we would uh, operate at an institution. One of the main efforts of the, uh, the Vivo project is to go from the local level to the national level. Um, so we're, what we're looking to do is pull filtered RDF, perhaps not everything from an institution, um, out to a, could be a national or it could be a regional or specialized um, indexing uh, portal and system. Um, for this project, Cornell and the University of Florida are going to build um, indexes across our entire sort of the Vivo collaborative. Um, and also to be able to do visual, you know, once you've got the information into a common triple store and all together, you can potentially do analysis, visualization, and uh, other exciting things. So the national networking piece draws, as I said, from these individual participating institutions and their individual vivos, builds up these RDF triple stores, does search across them, does visualization, and then networks in with other sites as well that might provide either um, vivo ontology, um, compatible information about their people or other RDF that we can map to it. It can be used by, for example, a professional association, could be either a consumer of information about uh, faculty at an institution or in turn a provider of information back to, to National Viva. So lots of possibilities and all part of the, the sort of linked open data web. So now we'll talk about how do we implement it and I'll let Val take over here. So in 2003, Cornell began development of Vivo, uh, and in 2007, uh, UF, University of Florida, where I'm from, uh, began their first implementation. Uh, in September of 2009, just this last year, Cornell, UF, uh, and five additional institutions, uh, were, we received $12 million in stimulus grant money from the NIH to enable national networking of researchers. Um, all seven of these institutions have Vivo currently installed. Um, the data is imported, stored, and maintained by the, by the local institution. Um, because that data is RDF compliant, because it's linked open data, uh, and because there's the common core ontology shared by all of those institutions, uh, Vivo enables networking on a national scale. So now we have seven institutions with Vivo installed, uh, and we're moving towards full implementations at those sites, and we want to expand our partnership. We want to encourage adoption and participation outside of those seven institutions. There are a number of ways in which, uh, in, in ways that, uh, that institutions and organizations can, can participate. The first and most obvious is uh, you can be an adopter. So individual institutions such as Columbia or Northwestern, uh, federal agencies such as the NIH, uh, or consortia of schools such as the CTSAs can all adopt and implement Vivo. You can also be a data provider. So Vivo uh, enables national networking of researchers. There's a sister grant uh, led by a Harvard team uh, called Eagle Eye, and they enable resource discovery. Every resource within the Eagle Eye grant has the ability to have uh, a person who creates or manages that resource, thus a, a, a data link between those two, uh, those two systems. Uh, data providers might also include your publishers or your vendors, so PubMed, uh, 
your subscription databases such as Elsevier or ISI uh, are potential data providers. Uh, and in addition to Colexis, which you may know is, is a similar product to Vivo, um, they've done quite a lot of author disambiguation. They have a large amount of PubMed uh, citations within their system, uh, and it's a possibility that they would, they would feed Vivo profiles with, with that data. And then, of course, uh, professional societies such as the AAAS uh, are curators of data, which would be very useful for, for building out Vivo profiles. Participation can also include uh, the development of applications. So Dairy, Digital Vita, other semantic web uh, uh, community members can build applications that reuse and repackage Vivo data, that, that pull that data from the, the local or the national level uh, and, and repackage it. You can be a, also can be a consumer of the data, so your major search engines such as Google, Bing, Yahoo, uh, again your professional societies, uh, and then any producers or consumers of semantic web compliant data uh, can participate in, in the Vivo uh, initiative. But, in, but there are a number of challenges uh, to facilitating adoption. First off, in developing Vivo, you, balancing the needs of the individual with the needs of the institution. Um, at University of Florida, many of the, uh, the researchers, they want CVs, they want bio sketches, they want collaboration tools. They don't necessarily want a Vivo that helps their administrators evaluate them. Um, the institutions, on the other hand, they, they might want a faculty reporting uh, tool. And so balancing, uh, you know, finding common ground between those two, uh, those two needs is a very important step for Vivo. Vivo was originally designed for researchers, uh, and, and the research community has been enthusiastic, willing to participate. Uh, that enthusiasm might you know, can vary based on whether uh, a researcher is early in their career or well established in their career, but generally speaking, the enthusiasm is high for Vivo. As we branch out to the biomedical community and, and maybe more specifically to the clinical community, uh, we're finding that their business model is, is very different uh, and, and so we need to, to better understand the challenges and, and needs of that community before we can really, um, we can really expect them to adopt Vivo. On the right-hand side of this screen, you see uh, a, a graph that, that talks about adoption trends. So in the very front end of that graph, we have about 16% of, of potential adopters uh, will adopt no matter what. If, they, it, you know, if, if it's exciting new technology, they'll jump on board. Um, on, the, on the latter half of that, that curve, we see the people, no matter you know, what kind of marketing you do, they're always going to be uh, late adopters of a technology. So in the middle there, we have an early majority and a late majority, and these, these two areas compose of about 68% of, of possible adopters. Uh, and these are the people that are crucial. We need to to identify what, what sort of makes them tick um, and then make sure that Vivo meets those needs and addresses their particular issues. We do feel that Vivo does that. With the link to the local data sources and, and harvesting data automatically and not making uh, local researchers fill out their own profiles initially, we think that that is a crucial step uh, to meeting the, the needs of um, potential adopters. And so in the Vivo model, uh, we, we choose to meet those challenges through the support and dissemination of Vivo through libraries. Libraries are, are traditionally a, a neutral entity on campus. We under, understand our user communities and the research environment uh, in which we work. Uh, my very first position in a library, I, uh, I, I was there six, I, uh, maybe about six months, and our IT and library were merged into one. Um, you know, librarians are very adept at, at information management and are increasingly involved in IT decisions within their local communities. We are also subject experts. So whereas I'm 80% on Vivo right now, 
Uh, I'm also an agricultural science librarian, and I understand, uh, I feel that I understand the needs of, of my agricultural science community and, and what drives them and what kinds of policies uh, affect my faculty uh, and my administrators. Librarians also have a very strong service ethic. We have a tradition of, of providing academic support to our communities. Uh, and maybe even what's most interesting for me as, as somebody working on Vivo, we can also resolve many of the data integration problems uh, endemic to legacy systems. Within my Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences, uh, it was sort of the, the putting out to pasture of one of these legacy systems that, that brought Vivo to us in the first place, where I presented on Vivo as a possible solution to this issue uh, and started conversations locally. So what do librarians do within Vivo? Well, we, are, uh, we do content development. So we identify what data, what local data to grab and push into our, our Vivos. Uh, we help refine the ontology. We look at the data, we have to understand that data, and then we, we, push, we, we identify whether the Vivo ontology will meet those needs, and if not, what ways we need to change the ontology uh, to better, to better uh, hold and define our data. Uh, we also make suggestions for interface refinement. Uh, and again, we negotiate with the people on campus who hold the data. We, we identify what data it is that we need, we tell them how we're going to use it, and in some cases, how we're not going to use it. All data that is stored in Vivo is publicly available, um, and, and administration, they, they have very legitimate concerns that that data isn't um, used improperly. We also provide local and national level support and training. This means the development of documentation, uh, website FAQs, presentations, any kind of publicity and marketing materials, librarians have their hands in it. We are, we are there helping to create those, um, those support uh, materials. Through vivoweb.org, we provide, uh, we are liaisons to potential collaborators. We create a community of support through user forums, and we also provide a, lot, a, a large amount of feedback, both on usability uh, and in the creation of new use cases, which we then deliver back to the development team um, for, for greater feature development. And then lastly, we, we also do um, marketing through the development of the PR materials, uh, and we do a large number of demonstrations on Vivo, uh, both at conferences, workshops, uh, and through the website. So what's, what's ahead in Vivo development? As of this week, this Friday, release one will be, will be deployed at seven, our seven partner sites on our production hardware. Uh, existing data within our previous versions of Vivo will be mapped to the local release, to the release one ontology. And then once that's done, we can then begin batch, uh, batch loading data um, from various sources on campus. So at UF, what we've done so far is we've already loaded our, our human resource and people data. Um, and, and once release one is out, we will expand to grants, to courses, to local events uh, on campus. Release one will then allow us the opportunity to provide feedback uh, on, for future releases, uh, feedback on ontology development, um, whether or not a local ontology needs to be built. We do not change the, the, the core Vivo ontology, that we need to keep that as consistent as possible for national networking. But it is possible in some cases whenever the on, when, when an institution has a very unique instance um, that you can develop a local core onto, a, a local ontology to help meet the needs of those, of those unique uh, types of people or, or, or data. We also uh, will increase or, or improve our usability, and Vivo will become open software under a BSD license, um, and the ontology will be available for download. Over the next six to 12 months, again, we will expand our data ingest framework to include a, a greater number of sources. Uh, we will provide visualizations, both in page and at the site level, and then we'll also uh, bring improvements to uh, modularity and customizability of Vivo. 
We'll again continue to provide uh, user support material, develop that as we, we get feedback from the community and additional adopters, uh, and we'll expand functionality uh, to meet the developing use cases. So there are a number of things that, that we feel uh, that we're doing that will help drive future participation. First and foremost, we talked about, uh, we, we've already mentioned uh, user scenarios. These user scenarios uh, will help develop the ontology, continue to develop the ontology, uh, and to identify key features that, that our users want to see within the Vivo interface. It will also, uh, we will do iterative user testing to improve usability. And we feel that Vivo, because of the, the uh, sort of the nature of the seven schools that are within, uh, within this grant, uh, we have a large array of, of, of different types of uh, administrators, scientists, clinicians, student staff. We think that, that Vivo is, um, provides a compelling proof of concept within the consortium. We will also be addressing interest from other institutions. This is done primarily through vivoweb.org. Um, and in August, on I believe August 12th and 13th, there will be a national Vivo conference. Anybody interested in, in participating in Vivo in any way can attend this conference. Uh, it will, will happen in New York City at the National Hall of Science, I believe. Yeah. New York, New York Hall of Science. New York Hall of Science. Uh, and, and at that, conference or even prior, if you go to vivoweb.org, uh, you can request demos, meetings, attend workshops, um, view any exhibits and, and download and um, use the, pu the publicity that we've been creating. That publicity is designed both to create, to um, increase our partnership and also to help sell Vivo at the local level. So, you know, you've decided to become a Vivo participant. How do you sell Vivo to your local community? And, and we have created quite a lot of publicity um, and, and PR materials to help you sell Vivo locally. We're also going to be doing quite a lot of network analysis and visualization. Um, there are three levels of visualization maps that we will be providing. Um, the first would be at the individual or in, uh, investigator level. These would be in-page graphs. Um, say within my own personal profile, I could um, view my publication history, the types of collaborations that I've done with, you know, with other people, say on grants or maybe co-teaching courses, um, and then view my co-authorship networks. Another level would be at the departmental or the institutional level. Um, and this would be, you could view trends in your research grants or your publications. Uh, you could view your collaboration networks or topical alignment with base maps of science. And then the last level is the network level. Um, and, and this would be patterns or clusters uh, by geography, by topic, by uh, funding agency, institution. Really, you know, as if we have the data in there, we can probably visualize it. So future versions of Vivo will generate CVs and biosketches for faculty reporting. We'll also incorporate external data sources for publications and affiliations. So this might be, um, say, your, you know, your, your database aggregators, your, your major publishing cit citations from, uh, from your databases. We would also be able to display visualizations of complex research networks and relationships, um, such as the one you see on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, which is a co-authorship network. We would link data ex to external applications and web pages, and then finally, we would realize the full potential of the semantic web. So with that, uh, I encourage you, Dean and I both encourage you, to go to vivoweb.org, take a look. You can request a demo through the, the contact form. You can, you can drop us your questions, your concerns, any interest that you have, and, and we're here for questions. Hi, I'm just um, curious. Can you say something about the adoption on the, the seven campuses that this is being extended to? Who, who owns that decision? 
Um, I'm, I'm, say, I'm uh, Brian Skip from University of Michigan, and we've got a bunch of different units on campus looking at a bunch of different products. There was an RFP that went out for an expertise database. We've got the med school using Colexis and finding that they have to invest heavily in correcting the data. We've got Elsevier staff. Uh, uh, I, I shouldn't say peddling, but uh, telling us uh, about the wonders of SciVal. Uh, Thompson has their product. So there's all this stuff going on, and what I'm finding is different um, individuals on campus have different needs, uh, different goals, and uh, this I mean, Vivo is very interesting, but I'm, I'm just trying to figure out on other campuses who, who makes a decision to go with, with Vivo uh, in, in your experience. So um, I can say that at, uh, at, well, first of all, at the participating institutions, they got a lot of money thrown at them by NIH, so they may not be fair. I mean, it was, they, they all agreed to, to take this on as part of the grant. Um, at Cornell, before, before the grant came on, it was, um, it was actually the provost's office, an assistant provost who um, saw the system, was excited by, it, by its possibilities at the institutional level and really took it on then. And I think, you know, I think if you're going to do it institution-wide, you need to get buy-in um, at that level. You need to uh, say, yes, you know, here's a system that is, um, first of all, will work across the entire institution. I mean, we've been talking here about, um, particularly about science, because that's the focus of the NIH uh, grant, but, but Vivo is not in any way science-specific. At Cornell, it supports um, all the disciplines and um, runs across the entire institution. So it's, um, it's a broad solution that can, can fit in anywhere. It is, um, will be completely um, open source and is you know, fully integrated with the semantic web to the extent that that, um, that is potentially of interest. So you're not tied to a particular commercial provider, um, you know, I, I, I don't know in detail a lot about the potential competing solutions, but um, certainly a number of institutions have found Vivo to be uh, compelling and, and have picked it up. And, you know, we will certainly be trying to make that case over the next uh, 18 months of the grant as we, as we roll out new capabilities and, and demonstrate the system more broadly. And if you're interested, as, uh, as Val said, you know, if you're interested in having us present to anybody at your institution on it, um, we can certainly do that. At, at University of Florida, I think, um, you know, I, I think the institutions see the value of having one system for that one institution. Uh, and, and at least at University of Florida, uh, the library was willing to take, to take on the, the challenge of, of pulling data uh, and managing a system such as Vivo. Um, and so in some ways, you know, with it, within UF, it's, uh, you know, if you have the backing of your administration, then I, I think it's sort of a, a no-brainer. It, it just kind of happens, yeah. it, it can happen to, um, the push can happen, you know, with the one organization that's willing to manage the resource. So the, the other thing I will say is Vivo can also really serve as a lingua franca. Um, for a bunch of different systems. We actually at Cornell, faculty reporting in some, but not all of our colleges is done using Activity Insight. And we're just looking at um, building a standard way to harvest from Activity Insight into Vivo. Again, you know, Activity Insight holds data that you want public, but also data that you want to keep private. So, um, you know, we have to be careful about sorting that out. But, you know, Again, at the administrative level, they really want to, they don't want to force all the colleges necessarily to take on Activity Insight, so Vivo can be the common, you know, cha channel language presentation across all these diverse systems. Yeah. Has NIH installed Vivo, or does it intend to? Um, I believe, are they talking about it? They're I, talking about it now. I believe they're talking about it now, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, we're still... Six months in. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're six months in. You know, nominally, what's what we've just done now is uh, is a release 1.0. It. Uh, I, I would not encourage anybody at the moment outside of the participants to put this system that we've got up today in production at their institution unless they're willing to take a few, uh, do a lot of extra work or take some arrows in the back. Six months from now, we should have something that 
that we could endorse for uh, for a production release. I, I would also add that uh, we have a, a we have a contact management listserv, and we're getting daily emails from people who are who are very strongly interested in in adopting or participating in Vivo. I'm Ann Dobson from UC San Francisco. So our CTSI has adopted, I think, a different product. So my question is, are these products, are they going to work together? Because, you know, this has been implemented and we've collected lots of information in it and would like to share that with, with so, the other. So know. certainly if you can expose information in RDF, and in particular if you can expose it in RDF in a way that we can map into the Vivo ontology, then you could certainly become part of the national network. So Vivo in that sense is not, um, is not exclusive. Um, it really is part of the semantic web. Um, you know, hopefully, you know, we can come to some slightly better uh, ontological mapping than just friend of a friend, but, um, you know, if, if we can, um, I don't know what you're using for, for an ontology it, it, it or... It came from Harvard, I want to say. I'm sorry? It's sorry? called Profiles. Oh, uh, yeah, Profiles. It came from Harvard. No, no, it's not semantic web. So, you know, we would have to look at how we could pull information out of that into a, a semantic web ontology. I mean, you know, essentially, Vivo and the Vivo network will happily work with anything that's RDF and can map to the ontology. Okay, thank you. I wonder if you might just take a second to talk a little bit about the considerations of, you know, public and private presence um, in displaying faculty networks you know, communications, uh, products, and all of these fashions, kind of the human, el you know, element of Vivo. So, so you're asking, you know, do I, about building sort of private groups and views of information where you would share it among colleagues rather than share it entirely publicly, is that? Is I, I that guess, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand the extent to which the individual researchers revealed through, you know, this type of platform not only within their community, but you spoke a little bit about uh, their presence becoming visible in different ways within their institution, across institutions. I mean, it could have a lot of potential impact, you know, in terms of a number of decision-making processes, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess the, uh, the assumption that we're making and our provost is making is that, you know, for our, for our institution, that level of visibility for, for faculty and researchers is good. I mean, you, ne you need to be a little careful about what kind of information you make available. Um, you know, actually one of the challenges of pulling stuff out of uh, institutional databases is, uh, you know, you want to make sure that the, uh, you don't include the grant information before the grant's publicly announced. Um, you know, there, there are lots of sort of timing issues. You know, it is more sort of public information and exposure. You know, at some level, that's probably happening already, just not quite in such an organized way. I mean, the, the web crawlers are pretty good at digging out whatever is available as online information about people. So individual facts um, probably are fairly easily uh, discoverable in any case. The uh, putting it all together, um, you know, Vivo does make it easier to sort of look across the networks and, and do comparisons and, and gather that kind of information together across a broad swath of science. And, you know, I guess it's a mixed blessing. So speaking of where information is gathered from, one of the early information flow diagrams you put up there had an intriguing circle labeled census data. Census? Um, oh, probably one of the linked data. I think I didn't. Oh, the linked, uh, the linked data cloud. Uh -huh. was, that, was that the big? Could, could, could well be, yeah. Was, did it have a zillion circles on it? A zillion, yeah, okay. approximately, or a so, zillion over two. <laughs> approximately like a zillion. Um, yeah, that's, so I believe there's, um, and I don't know whether, I don't know what the census is making publicly available. I assume it's either statistical summaries or geographic information or some. Um, it's probably not. But the, I mean, it's not, in, not individual information as, as, as and, linked and, to. And, and, and so perhaps say something about how non-individualized information would fit into this model, right? Um, again, we probably... person-oriented. Yeah, so, you know, you could... Again, Vivo is focused on individual profiles, so, you know, it's not that we're trying to only expose statistical information about an institution or 
or a region or something as you would with, with something like census data. It's, um, it's more that you can do network analysis and other things once you have the individual data. The individual data itself is, as I said, generally available and, and shareable, although you know, every time you do one of these network things, you can do interesting kinds of analyses that um, you might not have been able to do before. I mean, you know, some of the, I mean, there are all sorts of metrics now, scholarly metrics and other things that are taking advantage of publication data and being able to do kinds of, of graphing and analysis that really weren't easily possible um, before. So Vivo does enable that sort of thing. I, I think that's a good thing. <laughs> Hi. Um Recognizing that you had a big grant uh, to implement this, can you say something about the estimated costs for an institution to uh, maintain this uh, service? Um, so certainly before we got the grant, um, the Vivo at Cornell was running with um, you know, two and a half FTs. I mean, you know, there's the, there was the data ingest portion, there was some development. You know, I don't know how much of the development to allocate because, you know, it was, you know, so that wouldn't, you wouldn't have that much in a production system once you've gotten it up and running. I suspect the running costs um, aren't that high until, you know, as usual, you upgrade some system or change, you know, to a different system of record or, you know, add activity insight and all of a sudden you want to draw stuff from there and now you've got to do some work to do the mapping. The, you know, the sort of regular, data flow and operation of the system is is not very intense. I don't know what's, I, what's yeah, your experience. I think I might be I might be able to to be a little more specific because uh, at university, you know, at UF, when we decided to implement, we didn't have any funding. I mean, it was just two rogue librarians who saw the value of it and a and a an institute of food and agricultural sciences who wanted it. Um, I think we applied for a library mini grant of five thousand uh, dollars, which which paid for a a $2,500 server, uh, which if your institution already has a server, then, you know, that's not needed. Uh, and then we, we actually, because we needed uh, proof of Vivo's value, we used the other 2500 to have a student manually input uh, a, a ridiculous uh, number of publications and, and people profiles. And that's because at that time we didn't have somebody um, who could assist us with, with data ingest. Um, I would say that that's probably the biggest, I mean, if you're, you need to have somebody who's technically, uh, who's technical, who can assist with, um, with, with the data ingest. Librarians, I mean, if you have somebody interested in it, they can, they can reach out, they can, uh, to, the, to the data source uh, stewards and, and ask for the data. Um, it's once they get the data in hand, that's the problem. Uh, if you have somebody who 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 can um, who knows the process for smushing data, it's it's not as 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 difficult to to take that data and push it into Vivo. Um, I think, but that's maybe sort of a long answer, and 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 that's where Vivo's at right now. I think if if you um, if well, you know in a year or so, the the system itself will be pretty stable, but the issue of mapping from your own institutional um, sources of record into the system is always uh, going to be an issue. I mean, you know, even if you're running PeopleSoft and we've got PeopleSoft mappings, I'm sure our customized PeopleSoft is enough different than your customized PeopleSoft that that's, you know, there's going to be an issue there. So that's probably the biggest expense. Curating the system itself and keeping it running is, is not, a, not a huge issue. Yeah, uh, my response would be that in, in all these uh, sorts of situations in straightened economic times, one needs pretty hard business case um, for, you know, introducing some sort of new system, even if it's open source, and for maintaining it. So hence my uh, question. Yeah, the, you know, from the NIH's point of view, the ability to, to find collaborations and put together, um, you know, teams for, to do research and, and, you know, find grant opportunities. You know, for Cornell, it, we really have been able to connect people with, um, with funding. Uh, the system's worked for that. The system works at the level of, you know, if the president is going off on some trip to Africa and wants to know what kind of African research and other things are going at the institution, now he can find out. Um, and again, there's, so there's sort of the develop, I mean, the biggest economic 
Boone is is the on the funding, you know, development information side that the the institution becomes more transparent to its own administration and and to funding agencies um, as well as corporate. How do you handle um, author identification and how does that work as the data moves up into the semantic web? Yeah, we're um, we're looking we're working with some of the author ID efforts now. Uh, the, the ORCID effort, and uh, um, I'm not an expert in this area, but, um, but we're certainly looking at how we can come up with standard, um, you know, do disambiguation of, uh, of authors and make sure that we come up with a, a common mapping. Um, uh, there was, we actually held a workshop. Yeah, on we had a Vivo uh, author disambiguation workshop uh, where ORCID, uh, people from ORCID came. Um, we had uh, uh, Baron Mons. We had uh, yeah, uh, quite a lot of people and... who, are, who are interested and in, in, in knowledgeable in the area of author disambiguation. I, I don't know if, if Dean and I are, are, are really equipped to answer your question, but I, I do... Um, I would say that Vivo is equipped to, uh, to help with author disambiguation. If you're talking about pulling in publications from PubMed, from ISI, um, and, and melding those together, uh, you know, our, our partnerships with, with database vendors and um, with biomed, uh, 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 biomed experts, you know, the possibilities are there to assist in author disambiguation. So, so and, and I didn't go into this too much, but um, the, uh, the underlying semantic web application will do inferencing. You can do same as declarations to map, um, you know, to match up multiple different author identifiers and indicate that they're the same object. And, and the system supports that and, you know, you'll, you'll get a common mapping. And, and then in addition to that, you know, we, have, we do have a team working on author disambiguation uh, and coming up with algorithms. And, and so the algorithms take into account uh, the author name, location, maybe an email address. There's a lot of different things that they take into account. Right? The, the algorithms aren't, are never perfect, right? I, I know they're, yeah. they're, it's a very problematic area and, and it has to be something more uh, expansive than, than just algorithms. But, um, you know, I think the efforts are there. I think there's a lot of uh, leaders in the, in the yeah, field. There's certainly a lot of interest and in, in this, and, and we're I definitely think we're, talking to people about I it. I think we're going to find that there's um, some real movement in that area in the next year or two. Does Vivo include uh, a faculty reporting module, or are you thinking about writing one? Um, I don't think it includes an explicit faculty reporting piece. Um, Again, you could, you know, to the extent that you have the underlying data in the system, it's fairly easy to, um, to pull it out. You know, there was talk, you know, the, the, there was talk about whether to use Vivo for faculty re reporting, um, you know, within Cornell, as I say, the, uh, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences actually wound up going with Activity Insight because that provided them what they needed. So we didn't, we haven't yet built that capability, but I, you know, it would be fairly easy to do so. Maybe more on a, uh, at, at this point, there's more discussions about faculty reporting for an individual. So if you have, you know, you have a packet to put together for tenure and promotion, mm -hmm. you can, um, you know, Viva will make it easy for you as an individual to pull out that data and insert it into your, to the, to the packet that you're creating. One more, um, kind of related to the outcome. I mean, the, the platform's built to facilitate collaborative processes or, um, opportunities therein. I'm wondering to what extent those type of collaborations have um, come as a result of implementing Vivo on these campuses. Um, you know, at this point, we aren't far enough along to really point to, you know, I mean, I th we can come up with probably a few examples at Cornell, but, but you know, we're very early in the process at, at the other campuses. So we we don't yet have examples of collaboration across institutions um, out of Vivo. Uh, NIH is counting on us to be able to produce that. <laughs> right, right. I was interested also to you know, learn of student uptake and use. And is, can you describe a little bit more about any type of examples of that? Um, um, kind of facilitated yeah, communication? Yeah, I, I, I know there have been, there certainly have been examples where prospective students have used this to, uh, to find, again, across Cornell, 
you know, life sciences stuff is across a vet school and engineering college, uh, agriculture and life sciences, arts and science, you know. So it's really spread out and particularly PhD candidates may not know all the opportunities that people they have to work with and build a special committee. Again, at Cornell you can draw a special committee from all across the institution. So uh, certainly I, I know that the, um, the life sciences initiatives that, that were the start of Vivo have been uh, pretty happy with the way it's, it's enabled you know, prospective students and faculty to find out about what, what's available at the institution. Um, I, you know, I haven't been involved long enough that, that I can come up with specific anecdotes for you, but, um, but we could, I could probably get you examples if you wanted to get in touch. Is, I don't want to take too much of the time here, but is there an element of conversation that can be brought into this platform? And by that I mean I'm thinking about the kind of collaborative processes I've, I've seen um, yeah. evolving. So, so at this point, I, I think we talk about Vivo as an infrastructure on which you could build such a collaborative system. Um, and we're, we're very interested in those as opportunities and people coming to us with ideas for, uh, you know, for leveraging Vivo you know, information in the collaborative system that they're, um, they're working with. But, but we don't have anything yet. Thank you. All right. Well, I think we're out of time. So thank you all very much. Thank you.